All right, Ian. Um, the, 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 I was getting ready to call you here, and I'm seeing this stuff on the like Jason Kidd. So I have no <laughs> idea. As we all know today, you know, you can rabbit hole yourself to death. But there's some internet rabbit hole talking about the possibility of Jason Kidd coming back to the Nets since the Nets now need a coach whenever play resumes. Yeah, I think that hire, Ted, is going to be a really interesting one because of the Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving presence. You've got to find a head coach that can manage the egos and get the respect of not just the two stars, but the rest of the roster. So uh, there's no doubt Sean Marks' ownership, they're going to go through every possible box to check to figure out who fits this role. Jock Vaughn currently has the job when Kenny Atkinson got let go. Vaughn, who was the former head coach in Orlando, uh, played a long time in the NBA, was an outstanding player at Kansas, won a championship with the San Antonio Spurs. You know, I, I think there are some people within management that would like to see him succeed. Whether or not he gets a chance remains to be seen, but I saw the same internet rabbit hole that you saw, and Jason Kidd's name has popped up. Who said you can't come home again? It, it could be something in the cards. Kid yeah, wants to be a head coach again. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. So you saw him, um, you saw him both. You saw player and coach. Sure. The Nets. So I had the honor. I fell into this honor. His second year at Cal, I called all of his games that year. Um, the only, and then he went to the pros after that. Yeah. And I remember being blown away having grown up. Like you did, you grew up around New York. You kind of have a sense for basketball. And Jason Kidd on the court was a genius. On the court, an absolute genius. And I never forget this. I just can't. There was a game that year, and this is a game that in this day and age would never fall under the radar, but this was 1994. It fell under the radar. Cal played a game at Wake Forest, a Christmas time non conference game. Mm -hmm. Sophomore Jason Kidd, alongside another guy that had a long NBA career, Lamont Murray. Versus freshman Tim Duncan, okay? So, I mean, this in, in the ACC country, this is a huge game. Anyway, game is tight, comes down to the end. Jason has to go to the foul line. Two shots, makes the first, misses the second, and I'll swear on my life, I've never saw anything like this in my life. The minute he let the ball go, he ran to the spot where it was coming. He knew he missed, yep. and he knew where the ball was going to go. And he ran to that spot, got the rebound of his own missed free throw off to the right of the lane, shoveled it inside, guy flips it in, Cal wins. I, it's like, oh, man. Ted, I, I would tell you that this doesn't seem like it would be likely making this statement, but I know it to be true. Jason Kidd changed my career. Because of the fact that the Nets were an afterthought and because they had no juice and I was doing the Nets games for a long time at that point. He gets to the organization and everything changed. Everything, the way they were viewed, just calling the game. He provided highlights. The play that you just mentioned absolutely could visualize it because he did it in the NBA. Yeah. His instincts were the best I've ever seen of any player that I've broadcast basketball with. And Bill Raftery and I were doing the games at that point when he got there. And it altered the course of, of so many things for the franchise, for the broadcast. Everybody was paying attention. The nets were relevant. The broadcast, people actually watched. I had never experienced that <laughs> prior. He changed all that. Yeah. Uh, so that relationship, watching him as a player, getting to know him as well. He comes back as a head coach. And he did a very good job in that year with the Nets. Obviously, uh, there were some issues with management. He moves on to Milwaukee. Billy King eventually lost his job as the GM. Everything changed. But there's, there's a level of understanding that he brings that he can articulate to players that very few would be able to get to that stratosphere. He, he does have that. He, he's got that innate sense of how to play, and I do believe he can relate to players in a manner that others cannot. You know, it's the, uh, the minutiae moment here, because you, as I'm thinking, as you're saying that, you were, what, 25 years or so, right, with the Nets? Yeah, 26 something. now. 26. 
So by far the longest running net in this most bizarre <laughs> franchise in professional sports that I was around a little bit in the Long Island years. Uh, they have had eight permanent homes, eight different places where they played a full season, at least a full season in a game without ever moving. They've never had to apply to the league to relocate the franchise. There's no professional franchise like that. It's astounding. And when you think of it, it, it truly is. And I now have enough perspective to, to remember what it was like in those lean years for the Nets, mid 90s into the late 90s, early 2000s, and to see where they are now with an actual following, with an arena that has energy to it and can be vibrant. And maybe the part which has been the, the most surprising for me on a personal level, when I actually go out and do other sporting events and travel, whether it's NFL, college basketball, for the first time, I'm actually getting questions about the Nets. <laughs> Truly, like, <laughs> Ted, I, locally here, I live in New Jersey now. I moved to Jersey after I got the Nets job in uh, 1994. I ended up moving to New Jersey a year after I was reverse commuting for the first year, living in the city. So I'm doing the job for a number of years out in New Jersey. I would go to my local pizza place and people had no idea that I was doing the Nets games. They would ask me about FAN. They would ask me about the Jets. They'd ask me what I'm doing now. And I would bring up the Nets and they'd say, oh no, I, I didn't know that. So nobody was paying attention. It, it changed in a hurry with Kid. Then it dipped again. And then the Brooklyn move definitely gave them a little more, a little more swag, a, a little bit more meat on the bone for people to talk about. All right, I want to do one more basketball question. Then we're gonna, then we'll we'll talk about. I want to get a little inside broadcasting. But you said something about Jason Kidd a minute ago that I thought was fascinating. With all your time in the NBA, I've spent most of my basketball career in the college game, but I had two different stints in the NBA, the old NBA, <laughs> and <laughs> two different head coaches I worked with, uh, Johnny Bach for two years, uh, and Dick Harder for a year. Yep. And both have passed on, so I can say this because I loved them both, respected them both, but they both came from a mindset of another time. Yep. Where, and especially Johnny, and again, I'm going back to the mid-80s now when Johnny Bach had his one chance to be a head coach, but he was a Lombardi guy at yep. Fordham. I, it, it was, okay, my way is the way. It's the only way. And he was a mid 50 I mean, I'm going to be blunt. He was a mid-50s white guy. Yep. Even in the mid eighties, coaching a team with 10 prominent African-American men didn't work. And Dick Harder had a little bit, Dick was more rooted in just the defensive mindset. Um, that had been his mantra in college and then Chuck Daly, et cetera. Anyway, I've always heard this, that the, the, the coaching in the NBA is about getting along with the players, right? Yeah. Is that, is that is. true? Yeah, it is. And I don't think there's any going back. Uh, things have shifted in the NBA, and that's not to say that it's a bad thing. It's just the reality. And players have a lot more power in the relationship than they once did. Uh, players are dictating a, a lot more than they did because of the salaries, uh, because of how much they are connected to ticket sales, and to the identity of a franchise, uh, they can list demands and they can get them filled. And that's not to say they couldn't do that back then. They just didn't really have the means and the vehicle in which to get it done. You could demand it, but a GM or an owner would say, hey, we don't need this. We don't need drama. We don't need this dynamic. You're done. You're out. You can't do that now. Uh, when you sign on, especially if you're an owner or a GM, and you make a deal with a frontline player, uh, you are committing not just to that player and the salary, but you're committing to building with him and trying to find the right pieces around him. You only get a few cracks at this thing if you're a GM. Uh, very few of them can survive a full five-year cycle of draft, 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 a free agent here, a free agent there. If you don't show improvement, then you're going to be out. So 
uh, this is a very different working relationship now. And I think coaches, the ones that have figured out the balance and striking the right balance of massaging egos, knowing when to push, knowing when to pull back, empowering certain players as well, and then also determining when you need to step in and really make it about the basketball and about your philosophies and how to mesh those Mm -hmm. with the players. Uh, We're watching The Last Dance. Uh, I'm sure you've tuned in as well. It's been a lot of fun to watch that era. And that's when I started in the NBA. So it's brought back a lot of memories for me, just seeing uh, different visuals pop up on the screen of certain players on certain teams. And and it uh, uncorks so many memories on a personal level. But that's not the league now. That's not how things are done I, anymore. Let me, tell you, let me tell you about the league for a second. Just this is <laughs> this is the uh, the get off your lawn guy here talking. Uh, the year, the first year that I was the announcer for the Golden State Warriors as a twenty mm-hmm. something, you know, fuzzy cheek newbie, we went uh, played one game a year in Chicago at the old Chicago Stadium. Yep, went to broadcast the game. It was a radio only game then. We had no, we only did a limited number of TV games. This was not one of them because the Bulls were not very good. Uh, I sat at courtside at the old Chicago stadium and two of my college roommates came in from Chicago, who lived in the Chicago land yep. area, came to the game and sat with me. <laughs> they sat with me on press row courtside at the Chicago stadium. Might've been 3000 people at yep. the game that off season, they drafted Jordan. And the next year, everything started. I mean, that's what I kind of say. The first year I was around the NBA, it was the PJ. It was pre-Jordan. Even though you had Larry and Magic and the Doc, you still had really had three or four teams that were thriving, and everybody else was, was a weak sister. Yeah, and the last point I would make connected to this, Ted, let's take Steve Kerr as the example. Yep. Uh, Steve has such a way with people. He has such a... Uh, an innate ability to connect. And he also comes from that past, that NBA past, and had the Popovich uh, connection and won championships and was an excellent player at the role that he was asked to do in the NBA. So he's the type of candidate that I look at in the modern NBA that can strike the right balance, that understands the X's and O's, And knows when to push that, but also knows when he's got to take a step back and allow his players to go out and do their thing and do it in their way. So he's not telling you you can't be an individual, but he's telling you you just need to do it within the concepts of what we're doing and what the Warriors have done. And you lived it because you're out there. It was beautiful basketball. And it is the way the game's supposed to be played. It may be more three-pointers than some of the old school people would like to see, but boy, is it picturesque. And when it's working and when it's clicking, it's something to behold. And Steve happened to have the right personality, the perfect personality to handle everything that comes with being a head coach in the NBA. That's a great call, Ian, because it's, it is literally about 50 years later, the same game those New York Knicks played. They're just playing it better. They're better players. Yes, games, games at a higher level. And Steve Kerr is Red Holzman, right? And, he is. And what we're going to find out, I think, is, and I'm not, correct me, I'm not sure Phil Jackson has ever done this because Steve Kerr has gone through winning, 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 and now has had a, a terrible season. Yep. And things have had, you know, for multiple reasons, have in essence been torn. Now there, there's going to be a couple of key pieces coming back next year, but they're all going to be in their 30s. Yep. Can he bring them back? I don't did Phil Jackson ever really do that? No, never had to. Yeah. Never had to. Never had a losing season as a head coach. Oh, gosh, I didn't remember that. Wow. That's something. Okay. Uh, I want to do a little inside broadcast with you here because yeah. you are so, uh, as, as, as your friend Bill Raftery could relate to this, I heard you on, a, on another podcast recently and you were just doing this professorial um, take on a lot of the dynamics that go into making a successful broadcast. So I'm going to be Gilligan here. I'm going to be your little boy. <laughs> and just, you know, Raph, Raph, Raph will never watch this anyway. But he would understand. Um, but I went through this conversation so often, Ian, in baseball. I've had it with GMs and other sports. But I would say 10x in baseball where I spent 25 years. Yep. Does winning 
breed chemistry or does <laughs> chemistry breed winning? And I, can tell, I can't tell you how many times I've went through this with GMs in baseball because it's a dynamic question in a sport. It is. Baseball, the volume of games, the, the, the clubhouse chemistry becomes, sure. depending on the individual's viewpoint, has a, a level of significance. So translate that into the broadcast booth. We, a lot of us, certainly, I think the two of us are get tasked with this all the time. Make it work. Yeah, make it work. What is your Nobel Prize secret here <laughs> to the chemistry? Because, and do you agree with that? Is it, is it, does, does chemistry make a good booth or can make, can it two talented people come together and make chemistry? Yeah, I, I believe in a little bit of both because I know in my own personal experience, I've experienced both. Uh, I've, I've had very close relationships with people that I've worked with and I've seen it translate on the air. And then I've had not a whole lot in common necessarily with the person that I work with, but I have found commonality in the approach to doing the job. So yes, I've been in a position where everything was set up perfectly and away we went. And then other situations where off the air, I would tell you, I probably would not spend a whole lot of time with this person or I wouldn't clear my schedule to go out to dinner or go out to lunch with them. Yet, we still found something that worked. The rhythm was there. I think you have to be, as a play-by-play -play announcer, you have to be very flexible and malleable. If you think in this day and age that you can just do your thing and they have to adjust to you, whoever you're working with, it's not going to work. It just won't. And the you talk, I talk theory is not pleasing to the ear. As a listener, <laughs> yeah. that doesn't work. That feels like it's disconnected. And then this is where I know you have experience at this because I've seen it. And for watching hours upon hours upon hours of tennis through the years, late night US Open, and to see your relationship with John McEnroe develop the way that it did. There are some people that think, okay, as a play-by-play -play announcer in that situation, just ask a bunch of questions. It's not a QA. and a No. And a QA and a is not enjoyable to me as a viewer. I want a conversation. So yes, there are moments where a question does suffice and it could trigger a whole other conversation. But if you go in thinking, well, I'll just interview John McEnroe for three hours and we'll see how that goes. It's not going to go well. John doesn't want to do that, and the listener doesn't want to hear that. So what you mastered based on your relationship, you're curious. You were naturally curious, and you asked questions that would start the conversation, and you were also in a position of being prepared so you could tag what John said. You could put a period on it. You could put an exclamation point on it. And to me, that's where the secret sauce comes in. Are you listening? Are you engaged to have a conversation? Could you take what you're doing and just move it to the dinner table? And would there still be the same level of engagement? And to me, that's what separates announcing teams. I don't wanna eavesdrop on your conversation as a viewer. I wanna feel like I'm part of it. Yeah. And the ones that stand out are the ones that make you feel that way. Well, that's, I was gonna say, and that's when I've heard you through the years with Raftery. I mean, that's just, and, and it's fascinating because I worked a little bit with Raft back when I actually did a Nets game, a New Jersey Nets game with Raft. Wow. Sac Sacramento in the, it was, I was filling in for Steve Albert actually in the eighties anyway. Uh, but, and I had a, a few college games with them. So I've had the whole baptism, you know, being a fellow Catholic, I've understood the baptismal right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. With Raft. But, but when I did some CBS games, even with Raft, I, I even learned no matter how big the, the stage was, conversation and the other key word that I tell younger announcers all the time, listen. Yep. We get paid listen. to talk, but I think what separates us is who listens. Yeah. And creating a comfortable space. Yeah. You know, look, obviously I've been around you a lot now because of Tennis Channel and because of the French Open and we've gotten to know each other. So it's not just a superficial relationship. I know you, I know your family, I know what makes you tick. 
And I know that if we get stuck in a green room waiting for our matches to start, it's not going to be a problem for us to talk to one another for a half hour, for an hour, for two hours. And ultimately, that's how I view it with the partner that I'm working with. The other part, and this was really important for me, and I learned this at such a young age, I got assigned the Jets pre and post game show for WFAN. It was a big deal because it was the first time that FAN as an entity, the all sports radio station in New York, had ventured out and gotten the rights to something. And they had the Mets, but they had gotten the Mets based on the fact that they bought the radio station and the Mets came with it. The Jets is what they were going after next, and they got it. And they assigned me the pre and post game, and they told me I was going to be working with Freeman McNeil, former Jet, former UCLA star, one of my favorite players growing up, by the way. So they tell me, you're going to do the pre and post with Freeman. I said, well, what's his broadcast experience? He goes, no, no, he has none. No. He's done nothing. I said, okay, I'm very young at the time. They bring Freeman in for the first preseason game. I've not met him. I've not spoken to him on the phone. They bring him in for the first preseason game. We're going to do our first show together. But he came in about two hours early. So I spent an hour with him just hanging out, just talking to him, asking him about his family, about football, about his career. And I could tell already that we, we had something there. Then I excused myself. I told him I had to go get ready for the broadcast and I jotted down some notes and printed some things out and it was a one hour pregame show. And now we're in the studio and we're five minutes from air. And I look over to Freeman and he's sitting across from me at the old WFAN studio. And I said to him, you doing all right? And he looked at me, smiled. He said, uh, I'm going to clean it up here, Ted. He said, Hey, uh, don't screw me here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was taken aback for a moment and I said, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm not going to screw you here. Yeah. I said, what I'm going to do is make you look good here. And he put a big smile on his face and he went, ah, that, that's what I want to hear. So boom, the show starts and away we go. And I made him comfortable. And I realized this is a guy who was a highly accomplished athlete at the top of his field. And five minutes before we were going on the air for something that he was not experienced in, he was nervous, naturally. And he had that moment, even though he played in front of 75,000 people, played in the Rose Bowl, he had that moment of, I don't really know this guy, and I got to figure out if I can trust him. And I tried to calm him down and let him know, you can trust me. It's going to be all good. And that was, a, that was a real big moment for me as a broadcaster to learn. Don't take any of that for granted. Make sure your partner is comfortable and feels like it's going to be a safe, trusting space. Amen. I, you know, I use, it's probably a, a blend of analogies here. I often think it's like being a setter in volleyball. But there's, right. a, little bit of, there's a little bit of Gretzky, too, in this and that. To me, what you just hit on, the, 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 to me, the success or maybe the most pride that I've been able to take through the years. And, and as you said, most people think of John McEnroe and I also had the yep. chance, I did football with Paul Horning for two years, which was an wow. exceptional experience. And Joe Morgan became a very good friend. Despite an age difference, I worked a lot of baseball with Joe uh, and they would go and say, this is the guy I want to work with because they understood I'm going to pass him the puck. Yeah. I'm Gretzky. I'm going to set you up and yeah. give you the chance to score. Now, Gretzky could score himself once in a while, which was the other. Sure. You have to be the one. You have to be the one that handles the huge moment when that, when that occurs. But I've always thought that if your partner believes that you are there to help them be good, and, and, and the only, I mean, I could, God, if, if I ever put, I don't know if you've ever done, if I ever put a list together of the numbers, I don't know, I would never remember them all. But especially a lot in tennis where I've been the tryout guy, you know, they bring people up. Sure. The number of long time tennis announcers who, who did their first match walking up to sit in the booth with me at the U S open. Uh, and they're really, I can tell you, and I won't name them, but there have only been two people in, in years and years that I didn't enjoy working with because those two people made it about themselves. Yeah. They had no interest in being a part of what I was, there to do or what we collectively were trying to do more importantly they were just there for themselves 
and that's out of maybe a hundred people, only two. That's a pretty good. It's a, it's a pretty good rate. But it's no, amazing. it's a really stand out to me. Really good rate, and it's funny. Two things there. Bill Raftery, who we mentioned. So my first year, I'm doing radio for the Nets. I get the TV job the next year, and I'm having lunch with him in Milwaukee. And I asked him, I said, hey, how many different partners have you worked with? And he's like, oh, Bird, let me. So he takes a napkin out. He starts jotting down, oh, Jim Kelly. He's writing name. I'm Lenny Thurman. <laughs> and then we just hit a wall. He said, I, I can't remember all of them. Yeah, yeah. So it hit me in the moment that I should keep a running list. And I was still very early in my career. So I was able to do it. I'm at 135. <laughs> Wow. 135 different partners across different mediums, radio, right. TV, you know, pre and post game and you name it. The second part, and you really can relate to this. Not a lot of people can. Tennis brings out a really intriguing part of the in booth dynamic. Tennis analysts know so much. They have lived and experienced everything that you will see on a tennis court. They've done it. They've lived it. Many of them have lived it from the age of eight or nine all the way through. And it wasn't a team sport. It's an individual sport. So their mindset is very different. And how they approach and think the game is very different. So working with a football analyst, working with a baseball analyst, working with a basketball analyst, they were accustomed to being on a team. It was a collective effort. Tennis is so individual and it is about me, me, me. And it's the mind games and the strategy in your brain before you even serve. You're thinking four steps ahead of what you want to do to your opponent. And when I got dropped into the tennis world, what struck me right away is how well the analyst can think the game and say it out loud as it's happening. And I realized very quickly, like, I'm going to get out of their way. <laughs> Let them go and occasionally pop in, pop out. You ended up doing so many years of it. So the experience that, that you brought based on the history, based on matches that you called, based on uh, just your recall of the sport is incredible. My strength, at least in my eyes, was, hey, set them up, get out. Tell the story, because that's still part of it. Viewers want to be taken from point A to point B to point C. Make sure you know your stuff, but don't get in the way. They've got it covered. They've got all of that covered. Yeah. It's, it's tennis is such, you've lived it now. I'm doing a lot of it yourself. I didn't understand because when I was a young guy getting a chance, I was a ball sport guy that dreamt about being a ball sport announcer. And yeah. suddenly you get tossed literally fell into this thing try tennis and I knew how to keep score I mean that's what I knew okay right somebody said it to me and I'll never forget it It was a, an agent before I was getting my first U.S. Open try and he just looked at me he goes remember tennis is the one sport you can't go wrong saying nothing yeah brilliant one sentence I'm 30 plus years later never forgotten it because it's so true and as you it, you hear it I'm sure too if I could put the top 10 complaints through the years of your tennis commentary, the top 10 complaints, one through 10 are all the same. No. You talk too much. <laughs> Once the ball's in play, I don't want to hear you. That, no. That's usually what I hear. And our instincts as a play-by-play -play announcer, Ted, is to describe and to interject. And I realized quickly that tennis was reactionary. And yes, put a period on things. Can you punctuate it? Can you punctuate the moment? Yeah. And can you say what needs to be said in the shortest amount of time? At the end of a match, what we've now noticed, and it's become a big deal, is the PA announcer comes on, certainly at the big events, and the crowd roars, and the player now looks at every part of the arena or stadium. And if you're talking through that, you're really robbing the viewer of the natural sounds of the moment. So instinctually, I want to tell you the story. I want to explain what's happening. I want to tell you that they've advanced. And then I quickly realized after doing it for a few years, no, 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 no. Get in, get out. Make your point and lay out. Mm -hmm. Don't say a word. Yeah. 
I, I'm interested, as I don't want to keep you too long here, football is the one because what we're talking about, baseball, which I did for so many years, is of course the, the natural storytelling, free form flow. Tennis has it not during play. Basketball, I think, by its nature, lends itself to that because it is more of an urban, you know, it, it just has that city playground feel yep. to it. Football, to me, is the one that's fascinating always because it is more regimented. Play, stop, replay, play, stop, replay. Now, the game has changed a little bit, and college is doing this. Chip Kelly, I always gave him grief as he were the 49ers. He screwed announcers like you can't believe <laughs> because he just keep running plays. Yeah. Um, but but what, what I'm saying is that football to me, and, and talk how you've done this so well, because it doesn't, it's not a natural storytelling sport. Yeah, you've got to be really smart about it. And you have to be economical when it comes to the nuggets that you want to get in. If you're trying to shoehorn stuff in a football game, it becomes very obvious, at least to me, when I'm sitting back and watching that by hook or by crook, the play-by-play -play announcer just decided, I'm getting this in no matter what's happening on the field. Well, that's not how it works. It is a rhythm sport and the natural rhythm of football. It's a great television sport, probably the best, because replays are so important to the process, seeing what happened, how it happened. A really good analyst can look at a piece of tape quickly and decipher what the most important part is and guide the viewer through that process. Now, where it becomes a little bit of an annoyance is if you're working with producers that believe everything should be replayed no matter what, and a two-yard run that amounted to very little or an incomplete pass to the outside that sailed over the receiver's head, there's no reason to see it again, and you're taking away an opportunity to have some good byplay or to provide some piece of information that came out of your production meetings or something you noticed or your analyst noticed preparing for the game you're really in traffic cop mode more than any other sport that I've done as a play by play announcer for a football game. You're separating your brain. You have to pay attention to who's coming on the field, who's coming off the field. You have to be aware of what your analyst is doing and where he's taking the broadcast. You certainly have to be aware of the director and where they're going. Look, I know you're like me. I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I want to match the pictures. I don't want to talk about something else and see something else pop up. So there are times where I'm following. We have Bob Fishman, who's been doing this forever, one of the great sports directors of all time. But there are times where he's going somewhere and I may have to make a U-turn to get there because I want to match what he's showing. So all of this information is being synthesized at the same time. And as a play-by-play -play announcer, you're still trying to keep it simple and trying to tell the story and trying to do it in an energetic way. So the traffic cop comparison really comes to mind. There's just a million things going on and it's your job to keep it on the tracks. I know, I know we're getting inside here. So I'm just laughing because Fishman is fabulous. Um, and as you said that line, I'm laughing because when I worked uh, for the Mets, I had the incredible honor of working four years with Bill Webb Yep. You know, after Harry Coyle, probably the greatest director in baseball. Um, and Bill has passed on, so I can tell this story too. We had some moments during my years of the Mets where commentary would wander. <laughs> and uh, and Webby, one night, we, we always had production meetings during batting practice, uh, just by the batting cage. The producer, director, everybody would come out. We had a little meeting out there. So anyway, one night we're at Shea. And Webby pulls me aside after our little 10 minute meeting in the batting cage. He goes, listen, Teddy, listen, you, you got to keep them online tonight because you know, if they leave the ballpark, I can't go with them. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning that when the story started about the 1946 Washington yeah. senators, the got director it. shooting the 2004 New York Mets in Shea stadium is handcuffed, right? It's a fair, it's a fair comment. Yeah, it's a great line. Okay, um, partners, you uh, now work with someone, not the first, but on the leading edge of women to be a full-time analyst for professional sports. And I, have, I think this is one thing, and I, I hope you agree, Ian. I think tennis has been extraordinary on this front. And I know, I'm sure some of my colleagues would say there's still room to go, and I don't dispute that. But, I mean, I worked with women producing network tennis 30 years ago. And of course, women have long had um, 
seats in the booth and commentary. Now they're like Mary Carrillo doing play by play. It's, it's, I think tennis has been ahead of everybody else is where I'm going with that. Uh, now basketball starts and you get to partner with Sarah Kustak who played college basketball. Yep. Um, talk about that. Now, when that becomes your partner and you know that that's going to happen, the, the, how you dealt with the, that, any, you know, the getting to know the feeling out process. Well, the benefit, Teddy, that, that I had was Sarah was part of the crew. She had been doing sidelines for three years and had really ingratiated herself within the organization, the Nets, within the Yes Network, the home of the Nets broadcasts, and had made an impression beyond just being a sideline reporter. She had knowledge and she flexed it during production meetings, when we would throw to her every time, and you know this, when you toss to a sideline reporter, your hope is that they're adding something and giving you something that maybe you can't provide, something they see, something they noticed, a story that they did some work on. And before a broadcast with any sideline reporter, I might say, hey, what, what are your top two or three things that you want to focus in on and hone in on if it's storylines that you had even before the game starts? So I just know where they're coming from. I don't want to, to jump all over what it is that they want to do. So, you know, I, I try to pick Sarah's brain before games when she was doing sidelines and she would blow me away yeah. with her knowledge and her preparation. So when she got a chance to do a net game for the first time, it was really more in a fill-in role. And we were in Philadelphia and before the game started and we had already developed a, a legitimate friendship before the game started I just said to her, hey, look, there's no reason to be nervous. It's just you and me. It's the same stuff we would talk about in a production meeting or on the bus. We're just doing it now while the game's going on. So I think that put her at ease. And the fact that it was just a conversation, I was giving her room to work, but then I would jump in if I sensed that she had nothing more or that her, the timing was off. And this was just a fill-in game. And she did very well. And the next year she got five games. And then the next year she got the job. Hmm. So it was a gradual process. The lines are now finely blurred. If you're good, that's all that matters. She can talk the talk. She can back it up with her prep and with scouting reports and with the work she does around the league, getting information and being prepared, not just for the Nets, but for the opponent. So people can sniff it out. Like we're, we're in such an advanced part of, of that yeah. world now. Viewers, mm -hmm. know. within a minute, they can figure it out. If you're trying to BS your way through these broadcasts now, it's not going to work. You'll be exposed very quickly. And what everyone found out was that she really knew her stuff, and she had a knack for articulating it in a way that was digestible. And she's been such a natural... I don't even think about it anymore. Maybe that's the best thing I can say and maybe Amen. the best compliment I can give. That's it. It doesn't even dawn on me, Ted, that, that, that she's breaking new ground. She, she just won a, a New York Emmy a few days ago. And it's incredible. But even that, I, I wasn't like, oh, my goodness. It was like, yeah, she deserves it. Yeah. She's that good. You know, you, you said it. Billie Jean King made a comment in the Times yesterday or the day before about the pot potential merging of the, of the tours. And she made a comment that I thought was 100% right. And when she said, There's, there is a, we're in a better place now. Yeah. A lot of men in sports have daughters. I grew up watching my daughter play basketball all the way through high school. I wanted her to have every opportunity. Sure. That, and I'm not saying that this is, it's 100% that way, but it's way, way better than it used to be. And I continue, to agree with you that the, the whatever ceilings remain yep. and the one ceiling that I would talk to classes and tell young women all the time is play by play. So if yep. you really want to get a TV, don't just be a sideline reporter, not just, but don't think that's the only option you have. Go do play by play of games. And that's, uh, that's the last hurdle, but to have, you're right to have, Sarah. and by the way, you're also, you getting a chance. I've worked a few college games at Richard Jefferson. Hmm. He's a trip. He's a blank check guy. It's coming. I'm not sure who's going to offer it to him, but somebody's going to fill him. No, he, Ted, he's really good. And 
he's got this other talent where he can go places that others cannot go. And maybe because he made $120 million during his career and he, he feels no pressure or stress about potentially losing the job. And I said to Richard somewhere along the line, uh, I think it was the first season he started doing it later in the season when I realized he was good at this, but he could be a loose cannon. I said, you know, what's so exciting working with you, Richard? He said, what? I said, every broadcast, there's a chance that it's going to be your last broadcast. Everyone. You could end it at any moment. <laughs> yeah. So he took it with a grain of salt, and that's how it was meant. He understands. He gets the big picture. He really has uh, a clear idea of some of the things that he'd like to do in this business, and he'll probably do them. Yeah. We, we didn't talk. We're going to run out of time to talk about this. Three-person booths. But um, and that's a whole different dynamic. They had one near the end of this past college basketball season where Richard Jefferson sat with Bill Walton. Yeah. During a game at UCLA. And and I always joke with Dave Passion. I see him because Dave Passion are the guys that basically have the Bill, yeah. um, the Bill Walton experience ability during the season. But now Richard Jefferson, I, told, I couldn't believe it. Richard Jefferson went toe to toe with Bill. Oh, yeah. And there are not many oh, yeah. people that I've seen that can do that. So that was a great right. compliment. Well, and obviously, you know, Richard and Luke are incredibly yes. close. Richard basically grew up as another Walton yes. in many ways. So again, he could go places with Bill that others couldn't go. And he also knew the Bill outside of the broadcast. So he had 